Our next speaker is Greg Newby from the Whitehead Institute. Right. I'd like to thank Amy and the organizers for letting me talk to you today. I'm excited to tell you about our work developing a sensor for protein solubility and aggregation in yeast. So we're coming to understand that protein aggregation is, in a sense, a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can be the cause of many devastating diseases. For instance, Alzheimer's disease, I've shown here on the left, um, a normal brain juxtaposed to the brain of a patient who just died of Alzheimer's disease. And the neurons in, those, in the brain are dying because of the aggregation of A-beta, which we can see the plaques below. Um, let me use the mouse here. On the other hand, aggregation is the basis for a number of beneficial cellular functions. For instance, here I'm showing RNP granules, which are a form of protein aggregation. And we've also seen um, protein aggregation to be implicated in other cellular pathways like uh, human immune disease, uh, so the human immune system, and also in uh, memory. One issue with studying protein aggregates is that they are extremely non-uniform in their structure and stoichiometry. So it's been very difficult or impossible to study them quantitatively in cells. And to help fix this problem, we've developed the Y-TRAP sensor. The Y-TRAP sensor is composed of two, uh, two, two gene expression cassettes, which we integrate into yeast with a single plasmid. The first cassette is where we tag our protein of interest with a synthetic transcriptional activator. The second cassette is a promoter that uh, recognizes that specific transcriptional activator and uh, gives you the output, which can be programmed to be anything you want. Uh, I've used fluorescent proteins and LAC-Z, but for most of this talk, I'm using, uh, I'm using GFP. So we express this protein of interest fusion at a very low constitutive level so that we can probe its interaction with, uh, with the endogenous cellular proteins. If endogenous cellular proteins are soluble, we get high activity of the transcription factor. It's free to go and activate transcription of GFP. On the other hand, if the endogenous proteins are aggregated, our fusion protein is sequestered into the aggregate and we get a dark cell. We can take just a simple fluorescent picture of a yeast agar plate and identify colonies where the protein is either soluble or aggregated. For the most part, so far, I've used this system to study these interesting phenomena we call yeast prions. Here I'm just showing you two uh, yeast prions, the psi prion and the rink prion, and uh, the psi plus state is indicative of the aggregated uh, prion state, whereas the psi minus state is indicative of the soluble state, and we can detect that difference with facts. Uh, sorry, this is flow cytometry data measuring GFP. This is my favorite way to measure the Y-trap signal because you get such a, um, such a good sense of the whole population but you can also use fluorescence microscopy or a simple uh, fluorescent plate scanner to determine the aggregation state. Let me tell you a little bit more about yeast prions. So yeast prions are protein-based, uh, protein conformation-based elements of inheritance. Now the Oxford Dictionary defines a gene as a, as an, a unit of heredity or inheritance, and so uh, that's why I feel like it's okay for me to come to this genetics talk because I'm studying genes that are made of proteins. Um, on the right here, what I'm showing are two identical yeast strains uh, at the DNA level. However, they differ in the conformation of the sub-35 protein, which forms the psi prion. So at right, these, uh, these cells all contain sub-35 aggregates, leading to loss of function of the sub-35 uh, protein. And on left, the protein is soluble and active. This not only changes their color between red and white, but also has many pleiotropic effects and changes lots of phenotypes that we can measure in yeast by their growth rate. There are a number of yeast prions now. Dan Yarosh uh, gave a talk earlier where he identified many, many more in yeast. At the moment, there are about 50 that have been well, or sorry, about 10 that have been well, well studied, and I believe he's found about 50 more. Um, they, the ones that we know uh, more about, we've, we've been able to measure their switching rates in, in yeast cells, and we see that they change from a soluble monomer conformation to a self-templating aggregate at a rate of about one in a million cells, a frequency of one in a million cells. Once the monomer nucleates uh, an amyloid aggregate in these cases and templates into this, into this larger aggregate, that becomes heritable because chaperone proteins fragment the aggregate and forming smaller seeds, which are then allowed to uh, be transmitted to progeny cells and are inherited by the next generation. On top of these seeds of protein aggregates, fresh monomer 
joins up and is templated on, and that, that's how the seeds grow back into large aggregates. And this is transmitted at a, at a high rate between cells. We say that these are genetic elements in a sense, but they're not Mendelian. So if you have a mating event between two cells, one of which contains the protein aggregate, the other one has soluble protein, the aggregate or the prion state is always dominant because the soluble protein will be templated together into the aggregate. So the diploid cell will have the prion plus state. Furthermore, when you sporulate that and get four spores out, each of those four spores will also contain those amyloid seeds and will propagate the prion. There's evidence showing that yeast prions are effective for yeast populations to adapt uh, as bet hedging mechanisms. I'll walk you through how, how this could work. So if you have a population that starts out uh, all with cells containing soluble protein in the prion minus state, you'll get that random one in a million switch of a cell to nucleate the prion and switch its state and its phenotype to the prion plus state. If this isn't beneficial in the, in the population, there's not a, a lot that's lost. That one in a million cell will die and, uh, and be lost. However, if the cells move into a new environment where the prion state is beneficial, then those few cells that switch could save the population and allow the, allow the yeast to continue growing in the new environment. Notably, we don't think that prions are advantageous in most environments. In fact, it should be even more frequent where the non-prion state is advantageous, and so you can likewise get switching back out of the prion state. It's known that in stressful conditions, uh, mutations tend to increase in yeast due to loss of fidelity and DNA repair. And similarly, we might expect stressful conditions to cause increased prion switching as the yeast search for a phenotypic space that gives them better, uh, better adaptation to their current environment. Um, I'm particularly fascinated by yeast prions as this mechanism of, of adaptation because it's more fully reversible than genetic mutation. You can imagine it's very difficult to regain a gene that you had lost the function of during adaptation, but with a prion state, you can switch into and out of that state. Here I'm just showing three functions that uh, the different prions have in cells. The psi prion allows for the read-through of stop codons. Uh, the rink prion enhances the rate of inducing other prions. This rink prion is found in most lab strains, in fact, W303 and BY4741 and 2, both, both harbor the, uh, the rink prion. And the SWI prion is a different, uh, a different protein that forms a prion and is shown to recently to cause the loss of flocculation in yeast. Regarding this hypothesis of yeast prion switching under stress, we wanted to measure whether that's in fact true. Previously, uh, we've been able to use the red-white phenotype to look at whether the sub-35 or psi prion is induced in stress. But now that we have this sensor that directly measures aggregation rather than phenotype, we can look at multiple, multiple directions, both the gain and the loss of prions, and look at additional prions that don't have readily trackable phenotypes. So here I've grown the yeast cells in these stresses and diluted them away into rich media and tracked how much their prion state has changed. And we see very broadly that indeed stress does cause prion switching, and some stresses seem more specific to certain directions of prion switching as well. Next, we applied this sensor to look for mutations in prion proteins that are able to cure the aggregate or, or uh, disassemble the aggregate in trans. So the cell contains many wild-type copies of the protein that are assembling into the amyloid aggregate. We want to express a few mutant cells into that pool that cure the, cure the yeast cell. To do that, we use the variomic library that was previously discussed at the meeting. This is something made by uh, Shuen Pan and contains 200,000 mutants of each ORF. I took the 200,000 mutants just for SEP35, which underlies the psi prion, transiently express them, and we see several mutants that cause prion curing in cells. Likewise, we did the same thing for RINC, and one, one thing we were surpri very surprised to see is that despite these two prions propagating in similar mechanisms, it was very different classes of mutations that caused prion curing. For the psi prion, it's mostly charged residues that are introduced in the aggregating domain and cause curing. But for rink, it was truncations and deletions that were the most active. This tells us that maybe not all aggregates are born the same, and you might need a different bullet to target each one of them. Of note, this, this uh, one mutation, deleting 10 amino acids from the prion domain of rink, uh, is actually harbored by some wild strains. And we think that this strain uh, in, in nature would mate with partners and be able to cure that, that lineage of rink 
because we're using synthetic sensors, we're not limited to a single protein in a single channel. We've hooked up an additional transcription factor to a second protein and can measure the aggregation of two proteins in a single cell. So here I've shown the rink and psi prions in all four combinations how the, uh, and how we can detect each, uh, each distinct combination separately. Using this system has allowed us to find very efficient prion-inducing alleles so we can uh, bring the psi protein onto the rink aggregate and efficiently template it so that 100% of the cells will be induced to adopt the psi, the psi state. Um, this allows us now to have synthetic switches controlled by prion states, and we can determine whether we want the population to be in the low expression prion state or the high expression non-prion state. Switching gears a little bit, we want to see whether we can apply Y-trap beyond yeast prions, whether we can look at a protein that's relevant to human disease. As our first model, we chose Huntington with poly-Q, uh, polyglutamine repeat. So in individuals that have poly-Q repeat getting above 35 or 40 repeats, that individual is almost certain to contract uh, Huntington's disease in their lifetime. Uh, here I'm comparing the soluble readout of HTT with only 25 glutamines in the glutamine repeat with 103 glutamines, which we would expect to be much more strongly aggregating. We see that even though both of, these, uh, both of these probes are being expressed at the same level, we get a very different readout of their solubility. So here I'm showing uh, on the y-axis relative aggregation, and we see about twofold more aggregation of HTT-103. Notably, this is at that very low expression level we use to probe, um, probe the, the aggregation level. So at this, this amount of expression, we don't see any toxicity from poly-Q and it would be diff very difficult to, uh, to even see that it was aggregated by traditional means. One major hypothesis of the toxicity of Huntington poly-Q is that the aggregates are very promiscuous and suck up a lot of other cellular factors. This is something we can directly measure with Y-trap. So if we hook up other cellular proteins to our sensor, we can determine how much they aggregate as we overexpress poly-Q and make, uh, make Huntington aggregates. So whether we hook up a Q-rich protein or an N-rich protein seems to make all the difference. I'm just showing an example of several proteins we've tested. And you can see that all of the ones that have Q-rich repeats in them co-aggregate and are sequestered by Huntington aggregates, whereas N-rich proteins, which are equally disordered, are for the most part left alone. With that, I'd like to thank all of the Linquist Lab, especially my advisor, Susan Linquist, our collaborators at BU, Mo Khalil, and my funding. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, I have one. Um, so, so now that you can measure multiple prions at the same time, does the induction of one prion correlate with the induction, like do, does the cell that tends to have one prion usually have a different one or are they completely independent? Um, yeah. So we're trying to look at that in a number of different ways. Certainly cells that have psi almost uh, always have rink because rink is, is uh, involved in templating psi to a great degree. Um, yeah, that's one very interesting question, I think, that we're trying to look at by treating with those stresses in the dual sensor strain and seeing whether prions are lost or gained to get at the same time. I have that data and I'm just trying to, uh, had to leave to come to the conference before I analyzed it, so. Uh, Ready, can you take the microphone so they can record it? Thanks. When you, when, when you cure psi, with, um, with denaturing agents, et cetera. The, per, the gene hasn't changed, so then the psi state will come back. Is that, that like that's one in a million? Is that what? It will come back at a rate of one in a million, that's right. However, because psi is so intricately dependent on the rink prion, if you were to cure both prions, it would be a much lower than one in a million rate for psi to return. Thank you very much. Thank you.